covenant. That's a mighty churchy word if ever there was one, isn't it? It's also a word that describes relationships and promises that are made within relationships. I remember a youth group, a youth group in a church that I served where the teens would make a covenant with one another before going on an outing or a trip. This covenant detailed their mutual agreement about what was acceptable and what wasn't in terms of their behavior as they traveled together. So for example, if they were all gathered around having dinner and one of them pulled out their phone and got focused on their phone, the others would simply say, covenant, covenant. And right away, without anything else needing to be said, that person knew to put down their phone and to be present to the people and the conversation happening right in front of them. It worked very well. The teens actually monitored themselves based upon the promises that they had made to each other. Covenant is a very important word and an important concept in our theology. God is a covenant-making God, and we are covenant-keeping people. Simply stated, a covenant is a promise or a vow. You might remember in the beginning, God formed a covenant with humankind, promising life in return for obedience. And then after the great flood, which Susan aptly mentioned, God renewed this covenant with Noah and his descendants and with every living creature. The rainbow is a sign of the covenant. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth, says our good and gracious God. Friends, we are indeed people of the covenant. And covenant is a crucial part of our theology and of our lives as followers of Jesus, the one who poured himself out for us in a new covenant of grace. Now, in the passage that Alex read from Isaiah, God calls to us, asking us to come and listen. And God will make with us an everlasting covenant. What a blessing. What a blessing that we are privileged to be party to an everlasting covenant with the God of all creation. It's really quite astounding, isn't it? God will be our God, and we shall be God's people. God's beloved children. And it is in the waters of baptism that God reaches down and seals us with the Holy Spirit. God claims us, saying, I have called you by name and you are mine. You are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. You see, baptism enacts the covenant that God made with humanity. According to my Erdman's Bible Dictionary, which I pulled off the shelf this week, a central focus of the Judeo-Christian tradition is God's covenant with God's people. And this is always initiated by God. Theologically, we call this God's prevenient grace. Many a songwriter has sung beautifully about God's prevenient grace. And this is why in our tradition we can baptize babies. And, and we have a part to play in this covenant too. We accept God's acceptance of us. We agree to be God's people and to follow in the way of Jesus Christ. We say, yes, I belong to God. I will live as a child of God and follow in the footsteps of Jesus and be guided by the Holy Spirit. And so this is why, in our tradition, we also baptize tweens and teens and adults and anyone in between. You see, the covenant is initiated by God, 
and the covenant is accepted by us. Whenever we, or our parents on our behalf, if we are infants, whenever we are ready to accept God's claim on our lives. And today, Lillian Itamura Kennard is ready to be baptized. What a great joy and what a deep blessing for us as her faith family to celebrate together. Now, as I reflected on this passage from Romans this week, it struck me that these words were essentially some very, very profound words about how to live out the promises of our baptism. Living wet is what one author calls it. Because baptism is just the beginning. We have our whole lives to learn how to live out our faith. And hopefully we are always learning. And Paul's words to the church at Rome can help us out with that. Paul appeals to us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And this is what we do in our life of discipleship. We offer our whole selves to God. All that we are, all that we have, all that we will become by God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit within us. We give our lives to God. We give ourselves to God. And we do this so that we can become instruments through whom God works, conduits of God's love and vessels of God's grace. We empty ourselves so that we can be filled by God. You see, this is a daily discipline of being a disciple. Do not be conformed to this world, writes Paul, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a powerful command for any one of us, I think, at any time in our lives. We are citizens of another kingdom, or resident aliens, as theologians Stanley Hauerwas and Will Willimon of my alma mater, Duke University, like to say about we who are Christians. We are resident aliens living upon this earth. There are so many ways to say this, right? We are in the world, but not of the world. Lots of different variations, but it is, my friends, so much easier said than done. And I think we probably would all agree with that. Do not be conformed to this world. That's a very high bar. We are immersed in this world, right? Its values surround and influence us in many, many blatant and surreptitious ways. We have to actively and intentionally resist being conformed to this world. And it's no easy task. Christians are by nature countercultural, but sometimes we let the culture influence us too much. We need a reminder like this one from Paul to return to our true selves, to remember who we are, and whose we are. We need to open ourselves up again and again to being transformed. And if we might wonder how that is done, Paul tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now we Presbyterians focus on our minds a lot. And Paul actually writes a great deal about the mind, our mind and Christ's mind. Whereas in the ancient Hebrew understanding, the mind was more expansive than we tend to think of it today, Paul's use of the mind refers to the whole of human existence and experience as considered through the lens of thinking and reasoning. What's being said here then is that as we allow our minds to be renewed, we will indeed be transformed. Our minds are powerful places. Accurate or not, the voices running through our heads, the old tapes that get replayed on repeat, the stories we tell ourselves, they have a pretty big influence on us. 
What's going on in our minds can affect our moods, our emotions, our abilities, our interactions with others, and even the way we think about ourselves. It affects how we think about our place in the world and how we relate to God. So our minds need to be renewed. Paul writes in Philippians, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And to the church at Corinth, he's actually very confident and writes, we have the mind of Christ. In her research, which you may be familiar with, social worker Brene Brown brings attention to the power of narrative in our individual minds and thus in our lives. Referencing the work of psychologists and neuroscientists in her book, Rising Strong, Brene Brown writes, the most dangerous stories that we make up are the narratives that diminish our inherent worthiness. We must reclaim the truth about our lovability, our divinity, and our creativity. Now, she wrote this because many of her research participants responded to painful events in their lives by telling themselves a story about being unlovable, a narrative questioning whether or not they were worthy of being loved, of being accepted. She continues writing, this, this may be the most dangerous conspiracy theory of all. If there's one thing I've learned, it's this. Just because someone isn't willing or able to love us, it doesn't mean that we are unlovable. The truth is, friends, God's love for us is immeasurable and everlasting, just like the covenant God makes with us. In another one of her books entitled Daring Greatly, Brown writes this, she says, like our lovability and divinity, we must care for and nurture the stories we tell ourselves about our creativity and our abilities. Just because we didn't measure up to some standard of achievement doesn't mean that we don't possess gifts and talents <clears throat> that only we can bring to the world. Now, Paul gets at that in this passage, too. He reminds us that we all have gifts, every one of us, but that those gifts differ. And God weaves them all together to make a beautiful tapestry and, and to accomplish God's ultimate purposes. We are all valued and loved in the eyes of God. And it is in baptism that this is expressed most fully, most expansively. God knows us by name and claims us as God's own beloved. We belong to God in life and in death and in life beyond death. We belong to God. We have been engrafted into Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit forever. Friends, this is the truest narrative there is. God has made an everlasting covenant of grace with us. God has promised to be our God, and our part of that covenant is to be God's people. To be transformed by the renewing of our minds and our hearts. And one way to do that is to set our minds on Christ, to dwell in God's word, and to talk with God regularly in prayer. Daily interaction with God, daily interaction with God, sitting in God's presence, will surely help us to not be conformed to this world. It is, in fact, the only way. Now, this passage ends with some very beautiful words of wisdom about how, how to live out our part of the covenant, how to be God's people in the world, how to live faithfully as God's disciples, how to live out our baptismal vows. 
Listen again to what the Spirit is saying to us. Let love be genuine. In other words, love from the center and depth of who you are. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Indeed, focus. Focus on what is good and nourishing and just and true. Love one another with mutual affection. Be people who love deeply and lavishly without reservation or hesitation, without condition. Outdo one another, not in competition, but in showing honor to one another and indeed to all people. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Don't serve the many idols and false gods of this world. Serve the Lord alone. Everything you do, do in the name of and for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Persevere. Apparently, even Paul struggled with prayer or knew that we would. So persevere. Because, friends, prayer can take so many, many different forms. So I encourage you to explore and experiment with prayer and discover what works for you. And also know that that may very well likely change over time and at different seasons in your life. So we just keep readjusting to be faithful to God. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Now, the most recent updated version of the NRSV says pursue hospitality to strangers. I love that. It gives it just a little different accent, doesn't it? So not just extend, but pursue. Actively look for people with whom you can extend hospitality. Be ever aware, always on the lookout for someone to serve someone to befriend, someone to love, someone to show forth Christ's love. Friends, if we could do this, or at least give it our best to adhere to these words, to this wisdom, we would all be well along the way of living out our baptisms, of living wet. To God be the glory. Amen.